Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Podcast. My name is Stu Turley, President and CEO of the Sandstone Group. Today is January 10th, 2024. It's kind of amazing. Hey, I got an action-packed show today, but I'll tell you what, there's a couple things in this thread. We've got legal, we've got a regulatory legislation through regulatory actions, and we've got international funny kind of stuff. So hang on, buckle up, get your flight suit. We are going over uh, across the pond, and this one's pretty funny. Uh, Nicola Sturgeon's flagship Hybrid ferry now runs only on diesel battery as too expensive to fix. You got to love that one. Yesterday, Michael and I talked about France and bringing in uh, the new renewable targets. And this coincides with their nuclear uh, fleet that they're expanding out. Pretty cool news there. I'll tell you what. This next story is pretty amazing. It's about the government's hydrogen policy is a crime against thermal dynamics. We'll cover this here in a sec. Always got to love me a good crime. So now let's also take a look at German farmers begin a day a ma eight day massive protest against increased government taxation and alarmist climate agenda. This is a critical story that the mainstream media is not covering. This is important, and especially for our great uh, farmers, because they're under attack, and uh, it's just sad. We have to stand with our great farmers and farmers around the world. You don't have any farmers, you don't eat. There's a little bit of a conspiracy there for you for that one. Let's go to uh, irreparable injur uh, injury courts rule dismantling of wind farms in U.S. and France. This is pretty cool. We're going to take a look at some of the legis uh, legislation through regulatory actions and some of those impacts. So let's get started with the uh, flagship hybrid ferry now only runs on diesel. This is an amazing story. Uh, this is a ferry in, uh, in Scotland. Now, uh, one of the funny things about Scotland is uh, they have cut down millions of trees in order to put in wind farms. Now, uh, this is called the MV Holleg was the first in the world to use a system without carbon emissions by 20% when it was launched in 2012. It is an, a battery machine, a battery ferry that also had dual fuel, which is a uh, diesel powered engine. But you can hear right there that it was only 20%. So the batteries didn't last that long. The batteries broke on the, the $10 million vessel and it would cost um, six years. Now the problem in the ferry is the, MV Glen Rosa, which are six years overdue and 260 million over budget, which is additional ferries that they're buying in this configuration. He said the strategy was flawed and it makes a lot of sense having a dual fuel that you want to film, uh, you want to run on batteries and then use the diesel doesn't really get you that much because the batteries weigh so much and then they broke down and now they are more expensive. And so they're just running on diesel, dragging around all this weight. The report claims that the total running cost of the hybrid ferries is 259% more than a diesel only equivalent. Uh, the sturgeon was designed as the ship's godmother and said the time it symbolized everything Scottish government is striving to achieve. Well, kind of like the U.S. government, if you're trying to achieve going broke, looks like we're uh, not rolling right along on that. So I'm all in on hybrids, and uh, I think hybrids are the way to go, but you can't run them this way. Possibly there was a better design, and now that there are better designs out there, I think I would stop production on those other ferries. So, hey, let's roll over here to France. 
France drops renewable targets in the new energy bill. Uh, you got to hand it to France. Uh, they were the uh, poster child for nuclear. They've been selling a lot of their electricity to their neighbors, uh, especially in Germany. But over time, they were also, they reduced their 50 some odd nuclear reactors. They're only running at 25% capacity of their nuclear fleet because they have absolutely decimated their maintenance. So uh, when you take a look at maintenance on it, so they are now proposed yesterday, we ran a story saying that they're looking at an additional 14 uh, nuclear reactors. This is pretty exciting. In 1973, after the oil crisis, they put in 50 uh, at that time. Uh, so now that they understand they can sell the electricity, they're one of the cleanest energy providers in the world. Um, so this is pretty exciting news that this was a day after the, the other story. They're reducing their uh, ability to do the energy transition to reach its stated ambition of carbon neutrality by 2050. France will have to massively ramp up the production and share of renewables the studies have constantly shown. You can't do that efficiently, and wind and solar are not sustainable without printing money. Nuclear is capable of being sustainable, low carbon, and low emissions uh, because they can handle it through the markets and low cost kilowatt per hour. Applaud the French. Pretty darn cool. This next article is pretty amazing. The government's hydrogen policy is a crime against thermodynamics. Michael laughs at me because at one time I really had a lot of fun. I thought uh, hydrogen was the way to go. I thought it was great. You could put hydrogen in the uh, natural gas pipelines, change out the turbines, and you would be able to rock and roll. Uh Little thing called physics and uh, things that happened on econ economics of scale. Got to give a shout out to Irina Slav. She has brought up a lot of the hydrogen problems. It takes a lot of energy in order to create hydrogen. Unless you're using nuclear, hydrogen's not very affordable. And the molecules are so small for energy that they escape out of the natural gas pipelines causing danger. So here we on the December 14th, the government used the distraction of COP28 meeting to announce updates in its hydrogen policy. Hydrogen product uh, production delivery roadmap announcement of the results in construction of blending hydrogen into the gas distribution network in a strategic policy of the same topic. This is really uh, going to be expensive. 10 gigawatts of hydrogen production capacity to be delivered by 2030. Wind and offshore wind is now suffering from investments. Companies and countries have lost billions of dollars from the unsustainability of wind. And so I'm seeing that this is now a move to try to go into hydrogen in a huge way so that you can, again, fund these projects and have a wealth redistribution. If you are a hydrogen expert, I openly invite you to come on the podcast. I want to visit with you about the advantages of hydrogen and if it is truly sustainable. Why do we need to use so much energy to get so little out of it? I want to understand these things right now. There is a world crisis that several of the uh, NGOs have claimed that they're going to initiate. And if you sit back and say the uh, there's a water shortage, we have to be careful on where you can use hydrogen, how you transport it, and through the legislation, through regulatory actions in the U.S., how can we use the pipelines with new hydrogen in updating those pipelines when we can't even get all of the projects. We have 24,000 projects 
that are weighted to be attached to the grid. If we, we got some regulation issues to take care of. Here's another part of this whole theme today. German farmers begin eight-day massive protest against increased government taxation and alarmist climate agenda. This is a critical topic because the weaponization of taxes and, car and climate uh, activism against our great U.S. farmers is in play. Why is it that Bill Gates owns so much of our farmland and they're trying to eliminate the family farms? This is coming into the same thing. And my hat is off to uh, the Berlin farmers. And uh, if uh, Miss Production uh, Manager, if you could bring this in, uh, there is a nice picture there of the farmers lined up. Uh, with all of their tractors causing congestion like you wouldn't believe. Uh, farm subsidies uh, are a, a tough topic. I understand uh, subsidies on the farms. I understand. But how about some tax incentives? And as I'm working with a few folks right now, uh, Mark and a few other folks, we sit back and we try to say, how can the energy sector help the agriculture sector and really try to help each other out. Agriculture in the U S is one of the biggest uses of energy. And I'm going to have a call out to uh, oil and gas executives to try to help our farmers help humanity and, and try to really step up our game in to help lower food costs and energy costs. The only way that we can get um, uh, inflation under control is through proper and good and low cost energy. I'm welcoming any economist on this podcast to talk about that. The Fed has totally lost their ability to go ahead and try to fix inflation. My opinion, the only way to fix inflation is quit printing money and get your energy prices under control. So let's go to my last story here. When you have wind and the climate activists trying to put out as much as they possibly can into uh, energy, this is two very important uh, uh Legis uh, actually uh, judging and rulings that they have to dismantle these wind farms. Wind farms are not cheap. They are not sustainable from day one without the subsidies. Now, remember, we talked about this on Monday on the internet, on the uh, energy uh, uh, realities uh, podcast with Armand and the rest of the team is that subsidies go directly either to the consumers to pay for the high expenses uh, of the energy, or you use tax, uh, tax incentives, which gives people investment into that energy, giving lower cost energy. There's a difference between tax incentives and subsidies, but everybody has changed the narrative from the activist side saying, tax incentives, which comes from profits and not coming from uh, taxpayers. So when you take a look, one of them was in Oklahoma on the Osage Minerals Council on Osage land. They were fighting for their uh, estates. And so we're open for business and we look forward to anyone who negotiates what it with us in good faith. In this case, the wind farm had been built without proper um, approvals on the royalties. So the uh, state of Oklahoma, the judge in the Tulsa Federal Court uh, ruled in mid uh, the NEL North American, a subsidiary of Italian Energy NL must now dismantle the 150 megawatt Osage wind farm. Holy smokes, that is expensive. And, and when you take a look at uh, the 150 megawatt available, that's the nameplate of that uh, farm of those turbines. 
we all know that only 20 to 30% of that megawatt is available to go to the grid. So let's go to the other one that was in here. And it was the Burgundy's uh, wind farm. Uh, and it was um, after numerous environment complaints, focusing on the turbines negative impact on bird life specifically the golden eagle with one death already recorded on the, the the rare bird we've been losing thousands upon thousands and millions of bats and birds because as they fly through i thought that it would be just the wind blades hitting it and the bird should be able to avoid it in the bats but Tammy Nemeth was able to articulate that it is when you fly through the blades, they come through on the other side, and it's the pressure, uh, the air pressure that has changed that. That is about the most amazing thing that I'd ever seen. And then David Blackman and uh, Megan Lapp have been talking a lot about the death of the whales um, and the right whales and all of the other whales on the east coast of the United States because of all of the offshore wind farms. Uh, where are the activists, the ESG activists, when whales are involved, when birds? There's now mosquito breakouts where the bats are dying off. The second order of magnitude is in effect. I'd like to give a shout out to all of our great podcast listeners, all the feedback. I've got a new series that's starting out with George McMillan, and we are covering uh, geopolitical uh, activity, uh, energy, and uh, how this is going to shake out. I've got another podcast coming around, and it's going to be covering the Chinese weather balloon. It's going to be covering the how they have now got pieces into the grid, and they may be able to take the grid down. I'll talk about how that happens. And the connection between that, I've got Michael Yawn coming up. He is a war correspondent, and he was boots on the ground in uh, Panama. I'm going to tease this up. A Biden administration key uh, secretary was boots on the ground at a Chinese military base down there. Uh, what were they doing? We got film. So hang on, buckle up, and there's a lot of crazy stuff about to happen. Thank you so much, and uh, reach out to me at any time. Michael will be back tomorrow. I appreciate everybody's time.